Hi there. In this tutorial I'm going to cover the majority of the techniques I used to create this scene. So you can see we've got some wood surface, we've got some pumpkins, there's some candles inside the pumpkins, there's some variation in the focus of the camera, there's actually a little bit of mist in the scene as well, or patches of mist, and obviously we've got the, they're called gobos, the shadows of the tree moving in the moonlight. This is actually a scene that I rendered in Blender EV, so there are some limitations on what you can do. And so I had to do a few little tricks, particularly with the candle flames and the candle body, to get those to work. So I'll cover those now. So to begin with, let's just make the basis of our scene. So I'm just going to do one pumpkin and I'll do a simple floor, but I'll quickly go through all of the elements of the scene. So we'll make a floor to begin with. So we'll just add a simple plane We'll apply all transforms, so that best applies rotation scale and things like that. We'll go into edit mode put with tab and then we'll just press U and just say unwrap. It's a very simple shape, so that shouldn't be a problem. I'll bring up the material window. You can easily, of course, use these preset window setups. I have my own preference in how I want them to look, so I just do it this way. We'll go to the shader editor up there, come down to materials and say new, and we'll get a basic material there. Call this material ground and we'll add an image texture. Now I could have done this by adding images as planes but I didn't on this occasion. And if we click here we can see the textures themselves and on this occasion I think I'll use these sort of slightly algae covered planks. So if we click here we can start to see what it's going to look like once we connect it. And obviously at the moment that's just colour information. So I'm not going to go into lots of advanced material setups here, but I'll show you very quickly how to give it a bit of surface texture or to emulate surface texture. So I'm going to add converter, which is a color ramp and drop that in there. So we've got a monochrome image and now I'm just going to narrow these points in really just so that I can emphasize what might become the texture of the wood. The way you can see things like these knots and I might go to cardinal just to sharpen it up. If you want a smoother texture, you can go with B-spline. At the moment, we can assume that the white areas are the highlights and the dark areas are the low lights, as it were, the areas of the texture that are going to go inward. See, b spline's a bit too soft. So this knot here, for example, would be coming out. So we may want to change the way that that's working. And you can see I've just swapped those points over now and that little knot hole will be going inward rather than coming outward. So I'll just disconnect that from there. And a nice simple way to create an appearance of a surface texture now is just to add under vector a bump node and then take the color output from that color ramp and put it into the height. We'll go to rendered view and then connect the output of the bump map into the normal input on our principal shader. And you can see we've got a very coarse but recognizable pattern on what's otherwise a blank surface. Now obviously you have to bear in mind the resolution of the texture image and you can just about see there's some quantization here where the pixels of the image are visible but in general terms it's not going to be too bad. Typically though the strength will be too high so you need to turn that down quite a bit. We just want a subtle surface effect and then we can connect our color back up to here and now you can see even more so that the strength of that effect, that bump effect, is a little bit too strong. So we can drop it back a little bit. Still got an issue with that knot that's obviously white in the original texture. So a quick way to fix that, if we go to the UV editor, go into edit mode and there is our object with its UV. And I'm just going to select those two points, GX, and just exclude that little point. Perhaps even all the way back to there. It's a fence, I think. And that's made the planks wider in this direction, but also removed that unsightly knot. So now we need a lamp in the scene and then just to set that up so that we've got some basic reflections. So I'm just going to add under lights a sun. They're called lights rather than lamps now, apparently. And just rotating that a bit, perhaps a little lower. 
I'm going to give it a blue cast and let's go with strength of three for the moment. And if we go to rendered view, we can start to see what we're going to get. I'll also go to the background and we'll just say use nodes and we'll set that to simple black for the moment. And again, you can see that's not quite right. And by the way, we can just click here if we want to invert the sense of our bump map. And in fact, that seems to look better. And the strength is still a bit on the high side. So I'll turn that down a bit more. And at the moment, we're in cycles and GPU compute. So I'm going to change that now to EV. You can see that's a little bit quicker. Maybe even come down a bit further on the bump. It's better to be slightly more subtle and maybe even slightly too subtle than it is to be over the top. If you're going for a somewhat realistic look anyway. And EV, you can get realism, but it's obviously harder to do. Now, that's still a bit shiny. I can do some complicated things or I can do some simple things. I'm going to choose to do something simple. I'm going to add another texture, which is a simple noise texture. Take the factor output and plug that into displacement. I'm going to add a converter, which is a math node and drop that in there and change it to multiply. And then I'm going to set that to let's just try 0.1 for the moment. Set the scale of the noise up quite a lot, maybe even higher than that. So let's try 250. Set the detail up to at least 16. And then we'll reduce this to something like 0.01, maybe even 0.001. So all we're doing now is just adding, we'll go for 500 on the scale, we're adding some bump or a simulation of bump, actually displacement, to the surface that isn't coming from the texture map. So it just gives us something a little bit more realistic. And you can see we can go even higher if we want to. And you can try other types of map as well if you wish. So that will do for now on the wood. It's not the best setup, but it's a nice, easy, quick one. And maybe I'll add gamma node into the color. You do get this slight pause with EV while it recalculates things. And turn the gamma up slightly just to darken it. Now in terms of reflections, I think we can have sort of shinier, almost wet wood like that. That looks quite good. Or we can have really rough, non-reflective wood. I think we'll go with slightly shinier. So this isn't quite the same as the scene that I made. But we're going to be changing the lighting shortly anyway. So we'll come back to here, preview render mode. And you can see we get a version of the reflections even here. So we're now ready to make our pumpkin. It's worth putting the ground down first so that you've got a sense of scale. So there's a very easy primitive mesh that you can use to create a pumpkin, and that is a UV sphere. It's already part way there for you. The default with 32 segments will probably be fine. I'll scale that one down slightly and then lift it up. Just move that out of the way for a while. You could just make one segment and duplicate it, or you could just do this. Decide how many segments you're going to go around. Where I'm selecting lines, that's where it's going to go in. So I need enough vertices between for it to go out again and then back in again. So I'm going to leave three and then back in. So one, two, three, and that's selected. And that works quite well. So every fourth segment is selected. Press O to turn on proportional editing. Maybe change this to sharp. Now it's very round at the moment and pumpkins tend to be flattened, but we'll worry about that shortly. To begin with, let's just scale and reduce the size of our influence. And you can see what starts to happen. How extreme you go is up to you. And you could go with more segments if you want. I did quite a few more, I think. So let's try selecting the middle ones. We're going to add some more vertices to this in a minute. And I'm setting it to smooth. I'm just going to say shift H and that will hide everything except for my pumpkin back into edit mode and then just select the very top and bottom vertices scale only on the Z axis and then just play around with the amount you've adjusted it to get the sort of shape that you want. Right click and say shade smooth, but then also control to just to add a nice subdivision surface. And there's the basics of our pumpkin. We need to add a stem. So we'll select the middle point there, E to extrude, turn off proportional editing, scale it in a bit, and then G, Z to drag it up. Don't actually need those central, central vertices now, so we can delete those. We can see we've got a jagged line there, so scale, Z, zero. They'll still go in and out a little bit, but we'll now extrude that up somewhat, push it to one side, rotate it, shrink it a little, 
E and scale inward just a little. So it looks like we've got a few upset normals here. So a normal is this is an outward or an inward facing face. So if we come up to here, click this little arrow, come down to here under normals and we click this point here. You can see we get little lines. If they're too small to see, you can make them bigger with this, or if they're too big and you can't see where they're coming from, you can ad again adjust the size here. So if they're pointing outward, we can see a long line, that's okay. But if we look, it may be a bit difficult to see. If we look here, we can see there's a couple facing the other way here. So we'll select everything, go to mesh, under normals, and we'll say recalculate. And now you can see there's no weird little shaded part. So we can go and turn that normals display off again. So. I selected that ring and E to scale, scale it in most of the way, F for the final way. By the way, I've hidden the visibility of the subdivision surface while I'm doing this because it can sometimes get a bit confusing when you're trying to sort out normals. And there's just a few more. Just control R to add some more. So if I bring the subdivision surface back in, you can see how it's working. Now we need to just add another loop here, not completely down to the bottom, but close to the bottom and perhaps one here, just so that there's a good differentiation between the stem and the rest of it. So let's just go to materials and add some quick materials. So we'll make this pumpkin body and we'll just give this currently just a simple orange color and then go back into edit mode. We'll select one of these rings, control plus and a little bit more, add a new material and we'll call this pumpkin stem and we'll make this one some kind of green color for the moment. It's a fairly dark green color, I think. And then we assign that. It's quite a bright green. I'm not going to worry about unwrapping it. And strictly, there should be something under here as well. If you're going to display or show this side of the pumpkin, you probably want to add some more vertices in here and then add a bit, bit of the stem color or something like that. But for my purposes, that's sufficient. We've got that subtle ribbing that you'd expect from a pumpkin and it's already looking okay. So if we Alt H, that brings everything back and we can then position our pumpkin on the surface. And with a plane, really easy way to see if you're exactly on the surface because it has no thickness. So just G, Z until the pumpkin just showed through the bottom. And if you hold shift down, it allows you to move it more slowly. So just a little bit of the pumpkin poking through, that tells me it's on the surface. You might even need to go slightly lower than that. Okay, so that's the pumpkin there. We can have a look at the preview of the render. Uh, it's looking fine at the moment. I think the light is much too bright at the moment, so we'll come down a little. And the angle is very wide at the moment, so the shadows are very soft. And I would think, unless it's a cloudy moonlit sky, it should be almost a point light. So we'll go with a much narrower light. I've just tried point 0.1 there. And you notice in this case, it makes very little difference. In cycles, that would have made a difference. But because we're in EV mode, shadows are controlled elsewhere. So under the light settings, in this case the sun, we can play around with these settings down here to affect the shadow. Normally it would just be the angle. So if we reduce the softness, we go to one. You may have just been able to see the shadow became slightly sharper down here. If I go much bigger, you can see it's a much more blurry shadow. I want a fairly sharp shadow and bias affects the edges of the shadow. So you can just play around with those and exponent obviously the, the shape of the drop off between the edge of the shadow where it's brightest and deeper into the shadow. And if you want, you can turn on contact shadows, which you can see gives you a little bit more darkness down there. So it's looking a little light under there at the moment. I turned those on. I wanted lots of dynamic contrast in the scene. And if you want to see what your scene looks like without these highlights, by the way, you can just click here and that gets rid of it. So I guess I need to carve my pumpkin. So now we're going to start carving our pumpkin. So back into edit mode, press K for the knife tool. I'm just going to select pre-existing vertices just to make it easy but you don't have to and then press space and then K again and we'll do the same over here and then press X and delete faces and that's cut the first ones as I said I'm just going to do a very basic carving for this one but it'll become more clear in a moment when we give some inner surface. And part of the reason for carving them, apart from the fact that that would be traditional, is because I wanted to show the candles that I'm gonna put inside. So 
So we'll give this one a nice sizable gape. So I'm now going to go to modifiers. You can see I've got my subdivision surface on there at the moment. I'm going to add a solidify modifier. But just before I do that, I'm actually going to add another material. I've got two materials at the moment. I'm going to add a third one. And we'll call this pumpkin inside. And we'll make this a sort of light yellowy, maybe light orangey sort of color, very light colored, as you'd expect of a real pumpkin. So back to the modifiers and add a solidify modifier. I'm gonna push that above the subdivision surface and then we'll make it a bit thicker. But it's hard to see at the moment because it's using the first material. So down here under material offset, we click this here, you can see it's using the green material and click it again and it's now using the inner material for the inside but not for the edge here. So if I say two for the rim as well, now we've got a, a rim material that also reflects what we would expect. And of course we can take his mouth and just pressing G twice we can make it a little wider there. You can play around with where you have the subdivision surface modifier. In some ways it looks better like that, in others it doesn't. You may also want to apply these modifiers so that you can make a finer adjustment to the geometry. But we'll leave it like that for now. If we go back into here, there is our very simply carved pumpkin. We can, yeah, I think I prefer that method. We haven't got a lot of geometry in here, which is why it's doing that. I could apply the subdivision surface. Additional geometry would make this a finer finish, as it were. But for demonstration purposes, I think this will be fine. You can do click a few things like even and high quality normals, which may make a difference. And you can also adjust the clamping, which will effectively adjust how it's working, as well as the thickness itself. And you can go out rather than in, of course. I'm just going to go into about there. So that's made our pumpkin. Select the pumpkin and just press H just to hide it. And I'm going to add a simple cylinder. Now shrink that down, lift it up a little bit. And obviously this is going to be our candle. So just putting it on the ground or just above the ground. I'm going to add a few more loops about here. And then I'm going to select the edge here, press E, scale that right in, quite a long way, and then E to extrude again, GZ, perhaps tilt it slightly to one side, doesn't have to be, we're not really going to see this very well, but it's good to have a slight curve to it and narrow the end in. Control R and then use the scrolly wheel just to add a few more vertices here. Now, candles burn, they seem to melt the wax slightly less immediately around the base of the flame, but then as you go away, you get a, a well formed, and then obviously at the edge, you have a raised wall again. So if we select perhaps that vertex, turn on proportional editing with smooth, G, Z, and make sure the circle of influence isn't too big, we can start to bring that down, be a bit more like a candle would be. We can perhaps select that, turn that on to sharp, GZ and bring it up even further. Set that back to smooth. And I'm just going to select a few random vertices, some close together, some not. GZ and just expand the influence a bit. So this is where the candles obviously melted away and perhaps some of the wax has dripped down. I'm not going to worry about simulating the, the wax itself, but I am going to add some more vertices just about there, a little loop. And now a control two, just to add a nice subdivision surface, right click it, say shade smooth. And you can see I need some additional vertices here at the wick. But other than that, that'll do for my candle shape. Maybe take that down a, a little bit and we'll add some extra vertices there. So I'm just going to go to materials now and just say new. First one is candle body, and for the moment we'll just give that a slightly yellow color. And then another material, and we'll call that candle wick. And obviously we'll just give that a nice, sort of really dark brown slash black color, and assign that to the wick. You can see it's gone slightly too far, but we can narrow that in by just adding some more vertices and bring them in. So we're going to do a bit more with that material, but there's the basics of the candle body. What we should be doing, of course, is naming all of these things. So if we come up here, that's the cylinder at the moment, so we'll call that candle. If I bring the pumpkin back again, that's currently a sphere, so we'll call that pumpkin. And the plane down here, we'll call that 
brain. So now we know what we've got selected. We'll hide our pumpkin again. So now let's make the flame. So because this is EV, yes, you can simulate volumetrics in EV, but it's a bit challenging, particularly for flame. So to get a nice, simple, but reasonably realistic, maybe slightly cartoony flame effect, I decided to not use volumetrics at all. What I used was a cloth simulation. So I thought back to how some of the artificial candles seem to simulate flames, and I went along those lines. So I'm gonna add a simple plane to begin with. We'll raise that up, control, R just to add a loop down the middle. I was in edit mode, obviously. Delete those edge vertices. Control R and add a few vertices here. It's always best to go with slightly less than slightly more vertices to begin with. GX and I'm just gonna move those in. I want it sort of widest here. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to make a sort of teardrop fl classic flame shape. So let's add a subdivision surface to that. So I'm going to select that vertex, select that one, Control M, Alt M, and say merge at last. So that brings that one over there. And then GY just to drag it up a little bit. I'm also then going to come over here and add a mirror modifier, push that up above the subdivision surface. And now you can see the sort of shape I'm trying to make. So that's roughly a flame shape. I'm just gonna remove the subdivision surface for a minute and then control R and I'll just add an extra set of vertices there and just bring those and just bring those up like that. So at this point, just to make sure I'm going to select all the vertices, say U and say project from view. Now we'll come to materials. We'll call this flame. And obviously this is gonna be an emission material. So I'm gonna leave the base color at that basically a white color doesn't really matter. And I'm going to add a color ramp. I had quite a number of colors in here, but essentially the left hand side I had it black. Then I had a sort of dull red color. Next, I went for an orange, quite a bit brighter. Then a sort of more dull orange color. And you could see I could create that easily by just adding a new point that appeared between there and then just drag it over. Then a sort of bluish color. It's just a sort of cartoony view of what a flame might look like, almost a purple color. And then finally, black again. I used linear interpolation. These two I had quite close to the middle. This one somewhere around here, this one here, and this one somewhere around here. You'll obviously need to play around with that yourself. So this is the different colors of the flame throughout the body of the flame. Now this is a flat plane. It's not a volumetric flame. It's not 3D. You could play around with actually creating a three-dimensional flame and even using the cloth simulation, but I didn't feel it was really necessary. So I connected that to the emission on our material. And I'll just go to rendered view. Obviously at the moment, it's just a random color. Next, I added a texture, which is a gradient texture. Set that to spherical. Take the factor out of there and put it into the color ramp. Now, by partly by luck, it's pretty well aligned already. And just to improve things, I'm just gonna add my subdivision surface back in now. So control two, and there it is. But in order to allow me to play around with how the shape worked and so on, I also added under vector, a mapping node, connect that into the vector input of the gradient texture. And then I added in an input, which is a texture coordinate node and use the UV output and put it into there. So you can then play around with the settings here. So scale in this case, to get something approximating what you're expecting from your flame. And of course you can also play around with where these points sit. If you push them closer together, you'll get more variation in the color of your flame. And this also allows you to adjust the position of the flame slightly as well. And you can also try different interpolation methods just to see what they look like. But it gives you quite a lot of control and you can add more or less or fewer points, achieve different effects. Could add another point in there that perhaps was a bright yellow color. And you can see that's brightened up the base of our flame there. I'll go with that for now, and then I'm going to just come back into preview mode, rotate on the X 90, then go back into edit mode with everything selected, G, Z, so that I can put that little origin point there at the base of the flame, back out of edit mode and just scale it down to something appropriate to the size of my candle. And then what I did was I grouped it with the candle so that I could move the candle around and not worry about whether the flame's in the right place. 
With the flame selected, we need to go to physics properties and we need to add cloth. If I just press play at this point, obviously the candle flame is just going to drop through the simulation. So go back into edit mode on the candle and just select a couple of vertices at the bottom. Come into here, which is the object data, click plus on vertex groups and just assign. So we've got a group called group and that's assigned. Come back to the physics properties and then scroll down under shape. You can set the pinning group and set that to group. And now when I press play, the candle still drops, but you can see it's pinned just there. Now I played around with various different effects such as wind effects and so on but I actually ended up doing it in an even more simple way. But before we get to that, let's just set up the material somewhat similar to the way I did. Now one word of warning, particularly with cloth simulations, the size of your meshes and your models has an influence on how certain things behave. Generally, I find that to be more relevant for collisions and we're not gonna worry about collisions for this simulation, but something to be aware of. So I'm gonna give you the settings I've used but they may not be exactly right. They may not even be right for this version that I've made here, because I may not have ended up with something exactly the same size as what I did originally, but we'll go with it anyway. And one little point, if you click up here, you can actually select some presets for materials anyway, or create your own for that matter. So I stuck with the defaults for speed multiplier and quality. I'll go into detail on materials simulations again in, in a future tutorial, but essentially that's how fast things settle into wherever it is they're gonna go. One being the normal time as it were. So mass I set to 0.1, so quite a light material. Air viscosity I turned down. Air viscosity essentially damps the activity of materials. So I set that to 0.1, so a tenth. Left it on angular bending model. Stiffness I left at all the defaults. With the exception of bending, which I put up to five. So the tension and compression under damping, I left on the defaults. Shear, I set to 0.1, and bending damping, I also set to 0.1. As I say, we'll give this a go in a moment and we'll see if I need to tweak some of these settings. Let's play that now and you can see at the moment that just drops. Under cache, make sure that the end point for your cache coincides with however long it is you wanna be able to see this flame. So typically the full length of your animation. Default is 250 and so is the length, the default length for any animation. So for the moment, that's fine. We've already talked about the pinning group. One thing I did need to change under shape, we needed dynamic mesh on. So this is basically recognizing if we are putting some movement on the material and we are going to do that. So if the object, the mesh is moving in order to, for the simulation to recognize that that mesh is not in exactly the same position as it was when the simulation was started, we need to tell it that it's a dynamic mesh and to be aware of that. Otherwise it won't work. So we'll turn that on. We don't need to use collisions for this one. Property weights we're not worried about, but field weights, we do need to do something. So under gravity, as you saw at the moment, that flame is just dropping we want it to go up. Now I experimented with just using a wind force, but ultimately I wasn't satisfied with any of those. So to make the flame go upward instead of downward, I reversed gravity. So I set this to minus 0.1. And now you can see our little flame floats upwards, but it's only going upward because as it were, it's dangling in accordance with gravity. So what that means is if I apply some movement to that flame, if I move it around like this, for example, you can see it flops around. So all I've now got to do is give a bit of a wobble on that flame. Hopefully I'll get something approximating the movement of a real flame. Good enough anyway. So I've done what I'm about to do multiple times in various different other simulations that I've done. So those of you who have watched others of my tutorial probably won't be that surprised on what's coming. So I'm going to go to the graph editor. I'm going to make sure I'm at the beginning of my animation with the flame selected, hover over the flame and just press I, and I'm just going to record rotation. I'm not gonna record position. Then up in the graph editor, I'm gonna press N to bring up the right-hand window and select modifiers. I'm going to open this up here and just select Y rotation for the moment. So hopefully you can see Y is going into the screen at the moment. So that would be left and right, which is the main axis that I want it to rotate on. I'm gonna add a modifier which is going to be a noise modifier. And you can see we've got this happening. So if I press play now, you can see our flame is actually, bearing in mind we've got that cloth simulation on there, starting to move a little bit like a real flame. So we probably need to slow that down a little bit. So I'm increasing the scale and you can see it's 
wobbling more. It's actually quite a large offset at the moment, but it's going so quickly that the cloth can't keep up with it. I'm also going to right click on that and say shade smooth. Not that we should be having any shadows on it anyway. Maybe even larger than that. But it's a random pattern, which is quite good for our purposes. And if we think it's a little bit too stiff, we can add a few more vertices in there. But I think given we're not going to be seeing this flame completely, that's not too bad. What I can do, though it will slow the simulation down quite a bit, is actually increase the number of subdivisions. So I've increased the subdivision surface here, and you can see the cloth sim is below it, so it will be acting on the subdivided version of the flame. But you can also see it takes longer to run the simulation, the frames per second is slower. But you can always bake it, and I strongly recommend that you do bake it, so that it doesn't get upset if you're changing some other things in the scene. If you want to, you can experiment with putting forces in there just to, like a wind force, to see if that affects it as well. I played around with those, but ultimately I wasn't satisfied with that. If the deflections on the flame are too great, you can re reduce the strength, of course. I'll go with 0.5, because we want a flame that moves around, but we don't want it going around too violently, typically. Certainly not for this scene, anyway. Just a little bit of subtle movement, maybe slightly bigger than that, 0.75 and maybe slightly faster than that, so we'll go with 14. Just so there's enough there that we will see the movement when we're looking at the flame. So that's great. The only thing is, object lights don't illuminate things in EV. So I need to simulate that effect because this is inside a pumpkin, so we should be having some moving shadows and things like that. Simulate that, I decided to actually add a couple of point lights. Now I added two because the candle flame itself does cast a shadow. I couldn't find a way to satisfactorily, in EV, remove that shadow, though I'm sure there are ways. So an easy way to simulate this moving candle flame was, first of all, to add a couple of lamps. So I'll add a light. They're called lights now, not lamps. Simple point light. I'll scale it down. So the radius is quite small there. But I'll move it slightly to the front of the candle and give it a nice yellowish colour. Other than that, I left most of the settings at default, and then Shift D and Duplicate. So select my light, my lamp, select my candle, flame, but go into edit mode on the candle flame, and I'm gonna select somewhere in the middle, that vertex there in the middle. Control P, make vertex parent, and say yes. Because obviously, Flame isn't moving around as a single object, bits of it are moving in different ways. So what I've done is I've actually connected that lamp to the vertex at the centre of the flame. You can see that the light is associated with the flame. Now it doesn't seem to be quite joined to the correct part of the flame because I've got that subdivision surface on there, so there's actually a lot more vertices and they're moved around as it were. It doesn't matter too much, the most important thing is that I've got a lamp that is closely associated with the movement of my candle flame. I'm going to shift D and create a duplicate and you can see the duplicates already joined and put that there. If you wanted to you could remove the parent and move it up to, up to here. So it doesn't matter too much that they're spinning around a little bit. That'll actually just enhance the idea of what's going on. So let's just sort out the material for the candle itself. So we'll go for the candle body. This one's relatively straightforward. Under subsurface colour I'm going to set a sort of orangey colour. Fairly bright orangey colour. Roughness I set down relatively low. It's fairly shiny. Obviously by rights this area should be even shinier and you can play with different materials if you want to. I added a bit of a sheen. I think I got up to about 0.6, something like that. I left the index of refraction where it was and I set the subsurface up at about 0.945. You can already see that's having an effect. If we go to rendered view now, you can start to see what's happening. Now there's some additional things to do again subsurface isn't as straightforward in EV as it is in Cycles. Cycles it attempts to replicate the physical world. EV attempts to produce something that looks a bit like the physical world, but through little cheats, as it were. So first of all, let's click this and turn off the control points so that we can see what we're looking at. And you can see these strange layers. So we'll go to this little computer symbol, or whatever it's supposed to be, and we'll make a few changes here. So one of the ones I'm going to change is screen space reflections. All you'll see is a slight change here where we're picking up reflections of the surroundings. Again, 
it will slow the render time down slightly but give us a slightly nicer overall effect and I also turned on refraction not sure that made much of a difference I put trace precision down to zero I set edge fading down at zero and I left everything else at default For my animation I turned on motion blur I'm not going to worry too much about that but obviously the important thing at the moment is subsurface scattering so let's increase the samples and you can immediately see something changed in there I went for 10 and you can see it's basically an increased quality and then jitter thresholds this is obviously how it smooths it out a little bit you can see as I go up it's less of a distinct layering now there are still layers there this is how it works and don't worry too much about that slight effect around the candle flame because we're not going to have that there if I alt H and bring our pumpkin back and if I turn the pumpkin round so the candle's the right way around, I think the candle's possibly a little bit too bright at the moment. And that's where I can control it here. And I can darken it here as well, just so we get a bit more variation on the candle flame. One other thing I should have said about the candle flame, we want transmission up at one. And that means we don't get light reflecting from our lamps that are in front and behind it. And now you can see we've got more of a sort of flame effect. As I said, it's a cartoony flame, but you can play around with it and get various different effects from it. So if we have a look in there, we've now got our little flame moving around there and we've got our pumpkin. If I just hide the floor, we can box select everything there. Don't want the lamp and duplicate it. And perhaps rotate him a little there. And we can just come over here so we'll bring the floor back and we'll now simulate our moving tree shadows. I'm going to add a mesh which is plain, but if you've installed it, you can use images of planes. I'll do it simply at the moment. I'll just add a plane and we'll just raise it up. Have a look at it. In edit mode, project from view bounds, add a new material. I'm going to add color node, which is an invert node. And that's just because of the particular texture I'm going to use. And I'm going to connect that to the alpha input. Then I'm going to add a texture, which is an image texture. Connect the color output of that into my inversion node. Open that. And I use this one. You can create your own. You can draw one. It doesn't matter too much. You're not going to see it in a lot of detail. Mine is black on white, which is why I'm using the invert node. If it's white on black, you won't need that. If I just connect it into the base color, you can see where we are with it. And if you want to, we can go to the UV editor, select our tree shadow, go into edit mode, and then we can just make the tree occupy more of the shape. Doesn't matter too much, but we don't want too hard an edge, that's all. So we don't need that, but we do need the alpha. I'm going to make the reflectiveness of the ground, I'm going to make it slightly rougher because it will show up these shadows a little better. And now I'm going to angle this shadow mask to align with my sun lamp. And if we go into rendered view now, you can see we've got a shadow cast all the way across. And if need be, we can obviously make it bigger. But at the moment, that's not doing the effect that we actually want. I'm also gonna just quickly select my pumpkins, hide them, and just turn on, which is something I should have done before, contact shadows for these lamps simply because that will reduce the amount of light bleeding at the bottom of my pumpkins. As I said, things don't work exactly the same as they do in cycles. So that's a little better. So one thing that confused me a little bit using EV was I found I needed to do some different settings for this alpha mask, which is essentially what this little tree object is, compared to cycles. And obviously that's the case for a number of settings. So one thing that took me a little time to sort out when I tried to create this scene using the EV render engine was that there's another set of settings under materials that are not so obvious. So, so if we go to rendered view, you can see at the moment we're just getting a full shadow of this mask that we've created here. So it's not giving us the tree shadow that we were looking for. And the reason for that is there's some settings at the bottom here that are relevant to EV that we need to use. And under blend mode and shadow mode, you can see we just got opaque. Under shadow, we need to change that. You can use either alpha clip or hashed. I didn't see a lot of difference, but you need to use one of them. If you select none, you actually get no shadows at all. And that might be something you want to do with some objects. But for our purposes, I'll just select alpha clip and you can see it takes a moment to think about it. And then we've got our tree shadow appearing there. So there's a number of ways that we can add some movement to that tree shadow. 
but I'll do something similar to what we've already done with the flame and that is just use the graph editor to add a little bit of movement as if there's a sort of slight breeze in the air. So I've got the object selected, make sure I'm at the beginning and I'm just going to press I and record location. Now I'm going to go to the graph editor up here, open this up and we'll just select Y location for the moment. Go to modifiers, we'll add a modifier and we'll select noise. It may be difficult to see, but yes, we can see it. So you can see we've got some relatively rapid movement there. Just move that 3D cursor out of the way. That's obviously a little bit too fast and possibly a little too small, but we'll see about the size in a moment. So let's just turn the scale up. And you can see we're getting a little more movement there. We'll turn the strength up a bit. Possibly a bit too much. We'll go for 1.25 and see what that looks like. And we can adjust the phase to go for different areas within the random noise. Maybe we'll make the scale a little smaller. And I'm just going to size up that mask a little bit. And if we want to, we can of course add more noise, either to the, to the X again, or more likely, given this is already a noise selection, we added that to the Y, so we'll add this to the X and we'll add a noise modifier to that. Turn the scale up a bit. And the strength up a little as well. And we can try alternates down here, we can try hashed. I think that gives you a slightly fuzzier shadow, which may be what you want. And you can obviously play around with some other options as well. We go to here. I've got rather a high cube size there. The default is much lower than that. It's something like that. This is essentially the quality of the shadows. Now I've got soft shadows turned on. Again that just gives you some extra control. I did use a cube size of 2048 and you can see that slows the render down. In theory it gives you more accurate shadows. Whether you really need that for this, I don't know. I'm just going to go for 512, I think. And then you can play around with the cascade size. So again, that's going to affect the quality. But again, I think for most purposes of shadows like this, you don't need a particularly high quality. And again, you don't necessarily need high bit depth either. So you can see, one of the great things here is this is rendering pretty much the quality that it would render if I hit F12 in real time. I'll probably do a bit more work on the color of those flames. And I'm just making them completely rough textured as well. And that, that's just making sure we haven't got any strange little highlights appearing. And as I say, we can just play around with this to get the flame look that we want. I'm just turning the brightness of those lights down a little bit. The way that you can find them, obviously I didn't name my candle flames very well there. Nevertheless, you can see the little point lights are appearing under there, so it's quite logical the way that it's presented now. I'm just turning those all down to 1 watt. You could have used Alt-D to create instantiated versions of these lights, and then, of course, changing one would have changed all of them. So the only thing remaining now is that I also added some simple volumetric mist to the scene, and then changed a few settings in the renders. So to do that, I'm just going to add a cube. It's going to hide that object for the moment, look from above and bring my cube over to my scene, scale it up to about the size I need it, scale it down on the Z because I don't need lots of mist where I'm not going to see it, and just put it about there. We can make it perhaps a little bigger than that. What I don't want to see if I go to wireframe is any of the corners of that cube. You can see the corner is just visible there at the back there, so possible I might see some artifacts. Probably not, but I might. So if I go into edit mode, face select mode, select that top face, G, Z, and just lift it up till it's out of view. And then perhaps this face, G, X, and just take it out to there. The bottom one is actually hidden by the floor plane, so I don't mind about that one. And then I'll just go back into solid view. I'm going to change the way this particular cube is displayed because obviously I can't really see what I'm doing at the moment. I'll turn off shadows as well. And we'll just to say display as wire. And now we can see what's going on. I'm going to give it a new material. But actually, 
while there is a principled volumetric shader, I find it a lot easier just to use a simple volume scatter node for this effect. So I'm going to add a shader which is a volume scatter. So again, this isn't necessarily perfectly accurate, but it's easy to set up and easy to understand. So if I go to rendered view at this point, can't really see very much at the moment. And that's because I need to turn on volumetrics in the render option. So you can see they're not on at the moment. And I'll switch on volumetric lighting because essentially we're scattering light volumetrically. So you can see we've got a very misty scene there. It's nice to see that we can actually see something. That's quite fun. But I want mist that's not completely solid like that. Obviously I could just turn the density down and we'll get more of a slight mist effect, perhaps 025, something like that. And that's quite fun, that's quite nice. What I really want is mist that varies in density, especially as I want this to be moving, just as part of an effect. So I'm going to add my favorite node, which is the color ramp. And we'll drop the color output of that into the density of the volume scatter. I'm then gonna add a texture node, which is a noise texture node. Drop the factor of that into the color ramp. I used a relatively low scale of about eight and left detail and distortion. I think I'll turn distortion up slightly and that gives you sort of more swirls. I then move this bottom end of the color ramp up and to the right and you can see we're starting to get some variation in the density. Now that's okay but I want the mist to move. It's no, I don't want it frozen because I'm not making a still scene here, I'm making an animation. And to do that in a way that allows the mist to change shape rather than just moving the block I'm going to add under vector a mapping node and take that into the vector input of noise. And then I'm going to add an input which is a texture coordinate input. Now when I put this mapping node on, Blender defaulted to assuming UV coordinates. This cube is not UV unwrapped. So I need to tell it what kind of coordinate system to use, how to work out where pixels are within this cube. And I just use generated and there you go, it's back again. So what we now need is to cause that to move. So we're at the beginning of the animation. So I'll hover over location up here and just press I. So that's recorded that location. So this is the location of the texture in the 3D space. And an amount of movement that worked for me over a thousand frames was one meter. So this is only 250 frames. So strictly I should go for a quarter of a meter, but I'll go for half a meter just so that the effect is more visible. So we'll go to the end of the animation, change this to 0.5, press return and then press I over that. Now we don't want the mist to be speeding up and slowing down throughout the course of our animation. So make sure that mapping node is selected, then go to the graph editor and you can see the red parameter is the one that's changing there, which is X, select X, and then go to key interpolation mode linear. So it will move at the same speed from the start all the way through until the end of the animation. So if we press play now, you can see we are getting the mist moving and it's hard to see perhaps, but the shape of each patch of mist is also changing over time as it moves through the three dimensional space. And we could move it forward and back as well, of course. In this case, I've just got it moving from right to left and that's moving a little more quickly than I had it in my animation. And there's a couple of other things we can do for the volumetrics. If we want to, we can increase or make the tile smaller. So it seems like the way that volumetric is done quickly for EV is that effectively it's creating flat slices of our volumetric effect and then stacking them together so that from the point of view of the camera, they look roughly contiguous. So it's not calculating every point in space, it's calculating quanta, it's, quite, it's calculating slices. The less slices, the more quickly it will calculate that. So if I go up to 16 pixels, which will be a lower quality, it will actually calculate it more quickly. However, if I go down to two, and be careful with this because you've got a lot of volumetrics, sometimes this can cause Blender to crash, it will take longer to calculate it, and certainly there's a slight difference between 3D viewport and final render, but it will be a more convincing render if you're able to see slices. You can particularly see, see this when you move around like this see how it takes a moment to sort of fill it all in. If I put this up to 16, you may be able to see it's sort of more blocky. So if you want a really high quality one, set that to the smallest number. And obviously samples will affect that as well. I used 128. Again, that gives you 
a higher quality render, but it may struggle slightly as you, as you can see it is there with keeping up with the animation. So set it low while you're playing around and setting the speed at which you have the mist move, but then put it up to whatever size you want it to, whatever quality you want it to. You can turn on volumetric shadows and obviously that will cause some interesting effects if you've got lumps of more dense mist appearing. If we go back to the shader editor, that's the, basically the setup I used. But if you wanted, you could increase the density of the mist in the higher density areas while not losing the sort of empty areas by simply adding a math node into here and setting that to multiply. So if it's less than one, it will actually decrease the overall density of the mist. But if it's more than one, obviously where there's no mist, it, there will still be no mist, but it will rapidly increase because you've effectively increased the max density. So you can see we're getting some pretty weird cartoony sort of effects there. But you might want something more like that. And of course you can play around here. I used Ease, which gives you a slightly more subtle effect. And you can play around here, which means you have a faster or, or less fast drop off in the mist. And of course increasing distortion will give you a more swirly sort of mist which may be what you want. So I'm just going to decrease the intensity of this mist a little bit and now we're ready just to do the last effect. So I did this with a moving camera and things like that. It's very simple. We're just recording the location of the camera and then moving it and recording it again. But what I wanted to show was animating the depth of field. So to begin with let's add something into the scene on which we can focus the camera. So I'm just going to add an empty. So an empty is just an object, which can be a number of different shapes. You can even have custom shapes, I believe, that is never going to render. It has no real dimensions or anything like that, but you can use it to control things and also set where things are looking. I'm just going to hide that other window and I'm going to set this to about here. The position of this empty for this effect only matters in terms of forward and back, as it were, how close or how far from the camera it is. It doesn't really matter left and right, but I'll move it this way just to make it a little clearer. So that's the only empty in the scene. You can give it a specific name if you need to. But now I'm just going to go back to select the camera and we'll go to the camera options here and I'm going to switch on depth of field. And you can see it's all gone very blurry. And I'm going to say focus on object and start typing E for empty and say empty. You can see it's all come back into focus now. I used an f-stop of about 0.6. So you can see now the pumpkin at the back there is much less well focused than the one at the front. Though the one at the front isn't perfectly focused. And there is a setting in the main scene settings for depth of field. So this really is more if you've got little speckles of light in the background. It's a bokeh effect. For something like this you won't really see much of a difference. So I'm going to select the empty now and I'm going to move it around and you can see the effect it has. So I'm going to say GY to move it forward and backward. And you can see even the foreground pumpkin is now going out of focus and as I move that back you can see it comes into focus and then goes out of focus again. So you can already guess what I'm going to do. So I'm just going to put it fairly close to about the middle of that pumpkin face. Now because part of this pumpkin is out of focus that means my depth of field is a bit too narrow. So it's making this foreground pumpkin look like it's actually a miniature thing as if we're looking through a microscope. So for this particular scene, it wasn't quite the same with my other one. I need to have perhaps not quite as tight a depth of field. So I'll increase this number here, this f-stop, to reduce the amount of defocus slightly. So that will mean that the background pumpkin comes slightly more into focus but you can see now more and more of this one is becoming focused as it should and obviously we're in a very preview version of focus at the moment. If I go to the render view now you can still see it's slightly soft so perhaps we'll go up to 1.5. We'll go for 1.6 and we'll call it a day there. The exact number will depend on the size of your scene, the actual dimensions of your scene and the particular camera settings that you're using. But for my scene here this one will do. So I'm not going to animate the camera but what I will do is animate this empty and I'm going to go with the default Bezier curve for its animation. So we'll look from above and at the beginning of the scene perhaps out at about 25 frames, so one second, we'll store the location and then we'll go to frame 225 so about a second before the end of our animation, GY and just take it back. It doesn't really matter about its X 
location. So if you want to move it off to the side just to be sure you're precisely in the right place, then that's fine. It doesn't really make any difference. And we'll press I and store the location again. If we go back to the beginning, press play, you can see it does nothing for a moment, then starts to accelerate and it fairly quickly then moves its focus to the back. And in fact, I think I'm not happy with, with it taking quite so long to refocus because we'll have a lot of time with it out of focus there. So what we can do, rather than having to re-record all those, those two points again, we can just open up a new screen and go to the dope sheet and there is the empty. So if we press A to unselect everything, I have to press it twice, click that little point there and just press G and just drag it back. So we'll come maybe to frame 100. So now when we do it, it'll actually move a lot more quickly. It'll only take about four seconds to change focus, which is what we're doing. And there it goes. So if we now look from the front and we go into rendered view, go to the beginning of the animation, press play and we've got our miss rolling through and then you can see the focus changing from the foreground to the background and there it is so if I turn off the distracting control elements which is just clicking that little point there go back to the beginning basically watch this background one because it's a relatively wide depth of field anyway, which it should be. And you'll see over time that one in the back comes into focus and there it is. And this one at the foreground goes out of focus. And if we wanted to, of course, if we did want to perhaps simulate miniature, we can increase that f-stop. So I put that up to one or decreased it rather to make the depth of field more pronounced. And you can see that see that working now. There, that one's coming into focus, that one's going out of focus. And that's a classic effect for focusing the attention. And that's all for this tutorial. So I hope you found that useful. If you did, let me know. And I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, let me know. If you enjoy these tutorials, don't forget to click like and subscribe. I also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, and I now have a Patreon page as well. And I'll provide links to all of those in the description below. So I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot.